What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Today with me, I have guest Joanne Auden, who is a PhD in biology at Pacific University. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Great to be here. There's a lot to uh, unpack here. I mean, I've found that the best place to kind of start is in the beginning. So I'm curious how you got interested in biology. It was kind of the bane of my existence when I was in school. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm curious to know how you decided to make a career out of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. I've thought about that quite a bit. Um, and I think I lived out in the country, spent a lot of time outdoors, and I always liked just spending time there. And then in high school biology, we had a a project to go monitor a somewhere and kind of follow it through the seasons. And I really liked checking out this field across the house, um, across from where I lived. And um, yeah, I got into it there. And then I got really interested in DNA when I was in high school biology, um, an advanced placement class. And the first time I learned about DNA, I was so excited and learning about the structure and just seeing the two strands and learning about the enzymes. And I walked out of the door and turned to my friend and I was like, that's what I want to do someday. And, um, and it stuck. <laughs> so I, I'm just, I think I like the tiny things. I like, like DNA, I like little tubes, like grinding things up and finding things that you can't usually see and le- learning about whatever stories there are behind that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you, you, what, what is your main area of research that you're, you're looking into right now? Right. So symbiosis is my my current jam. Uh, So basically, I look at associations between two organisms that are different species and see how they interact with each other. Um, And specifically right now, I'm looking at their evolutionary histories, trying to figure out over millions of years based on their DNA, how are they related to each other? um, And how are there other species that are um, similar to them? How do they have patterns within that history? Okay. I do, now that we're, symbiosis is your your main field of study, I do have to ask you, I saw this video a few months back and it blew my mind of a badger and a coyote that were like hunting together. And I was wondering if you had any like knowledge of like, like this symbiosis that's going on between these two species. Um, Cause I've never seen anything like that, but it's, it's all like a, almost like a game camera that, that hunters use. You see this coyote, like, kind of like he's playing and you see this badger playing back with him and then they just go straight down this tunnel together. Like they're, they're off Dang. ready to murder the world, you know, whatever. I, I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> and so I was wondering, I'm, I've, I've ever since then, I was like, uh, I think it was, I don't, I wish I had the video. Joan, see if you can find that. Um, but I was wondering if you knew anything about that. Cause that's news to me. I, I, you know, I, I heard something about that. That's like a behavioral symbiosis. So social symbioses definitely happen. Um, and um, it reminds me of the honey badger video of old. And I think I would definitely want a honey badger on my team. Oh, yeah. um, I think they might be more of like a lone wolf kind of a thing. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not totally surprised that that happens because there are a lot of symbioses that are that are described, like where birds will eat the skin off of a rhinoceros um, or pluck off um, blood sucking insects and eat them mm-hmm. from like a hippopotamus or something like that. Um, so, so there are certainly examples of that. I haven't heard of the hunting one before, but, um, yeah, it's a partnership. It's beneficial in some way. It would be interesting to find out like if that was just a kind of one-off thing or if like that's common in those communities. Um, yeah. You know, and that's very cool. I don't know. I think that that in that scenario, I'm pretty, I would, I can't say that I'm up to date on everything that's going on in the natural world, but like that was a very big surprise to me. I think that maybe in that case, it may have been a one-off thing, but it definitely kind of perked the ears of science. Like, Whoa, this is, this is unusual. Like something like that is, is pretty unusual. Um, could you kind of give the listeners some examples of, uh, symbiosis that occur? Cause I mean, the one that pops into my mind is the, the, the connection between mycelium and trees and them exchanging nutrients. Like that one fascinated me. Um, we, yeah. we, we, there's what 
can't think of the names of the species, but there's sharks that'll open their mouth. They have a little fish go in there and clean all the the, the remnants of their last. The yeah, fish. the cleaner fish, exactly. So there's definitely, yeah. but I mean, I'm I'm there's definitely some that I ha- haven't thought of, and I, I'm really interested to know. Yeah. So um, so there are are symbioses everywhere, um, above ground, underground, in the water. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, another one that I really like is coral reefs. Mm. So coral reefs are uh, symbiosis between coral and then algae that live inside of them. And when coral bleaching occurs, that's when the symbiosis breaks down sometimes because the water uh, temperature or quality changes. And so the symbionts are like, I'm out of here. Rather just live in the ocean on my own than in your little coral house. <laughs> <laughs> Sink and ship. Um, so, so corals, I think, are really fascinating. Big implications about how to maintain that symbiosis and maybe how to reestablish it for reefs or farm corals uh, to help with the reefs. Uh, so that's a that's a good one. Um, also, in the deep sea, the vents, um, the really hot hydrothermal vents, will have um, a variety of different tube worms that um, have little bacteria that live inside of them and can allow them to um, to get nutrients from this very weird metallic um, volcanic eruption. Um, and then there are some glowing symbioses as well, where fish or squid have bacteria that can glow. Um, and so then they hold them in special little organs, sometimes like the, um, and finding Nemo, the, the, um, uh, angler fish mm-hmm. that's got like, um, a light up in its angle yeah. and can then fish for others or maybe attract a mate. Um, that's a symbiotic relationship as well. Um, and just the production of that weird lure is also something that's happened over evolutionary time, um, because of that established symbiosis. So the, in the, in the case of bioluminescence, like is most of that a symbiotic relationship between, you know, animal species or fish species and bacteria or is there some some types of animals that just are able to produce chemical reactions that produce light like or is it all a matter of symbi- symbiotic relationships yeah that's a great question um so with the symbiosis, usually the bacteria, the examples I know of, and there's always ones like the one you just mentioned where you're like, hey, somebody just found this one thing on film or captured this. And, and you're like, whoa, that's so weird. That's not supposed to happen, but it did. Yeah. Um, so but overall, the bacteria produce the light and then the whatever the animal or fish is then holds it. Um, and those are, as far as I've seen, usually aquatic. And there's a lot of examples of fish uh, with that. Um I mean, I'd love it if there's something like on Avatar where there's like glowing terrestrial things, people running around. Like, I'm, I'm hoping we discover some of those. Um, there are some worms in caves, uh, kind of cave-like areas in New Zealand that can glow. And I'm not sure if that's due to a symbiont or if it's actually the worm. Um, and sometimes you literally have to dig into that to find out, like, who's doing this. Um, so and then sometimes they can tag team reactions, not so much with light, but sometimes the host and the symbiont that lives inside of it will like process something for nutrients and kind of like they're shipping things back and forth. So they'll do one step, send it over here, do another step, send it back. So they really um, tightly can coordinate um, whatever their process is. Um, okay, that's that's super. Yeah. That's very interesting. Like biology, I have to admit, biology is a field that I really don't. It's it's pretty it's pretty broad in its scope, right? You see, so you're focusing on symbiosis. It's it's kind of a study of the natural world. Like, this is a super weird question, but like, for my own mind, right? Because I'm I jump all over the place. This is the first biology. Like, you're an expert in biology. I, I generally play in the realm of physics and engineering and space. So I'm, I, f- I feel like a novice here. Like the biology is, is, is a study of what that's a su- silly question, but honestly, I do not know the answer other than like, I, I it, it yeah. deals with DNA and it's like, I don't think I've really like actually sat down and be like, I, what is the definition of biology? No, I have no idea. Right. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Um, the study of living organisms and then there's always definitions, right? So then how do we define living organisms or organisms? And so basically then there can be a list of criteria, but that is usually something that's made of cells. It could be made up of a single cell or it could be made up of many cells. Like we're made up of trillions of cells, each adult human. Um, and then, so how do we do our metabolism? How do we reproduce? How do we, um, 
um, how do we, we change over time, whether it's aging or evolution. Um, so the study of living things. And then there's like the, the things that are on the side, on the edges too. So like viruses aren't usually considered alive because they have to have something else that can allow them to reproduce. Um, so reproduction is really tied into biology in that definition. But, I mean, um, viruses. And then, oh, go ahead, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to launch into something else. So you go. I was just going to say viruses are super weird because like they're able to replicate, right? And, and they've been around since forever, but I feel like there's some sort of intelligence inherently in a virus that, you know, we're not, we don't quite understand. Um, I just had uh, interviewed a doctor that is doing age research. He was telling me about how M mRNA is like, you know, it's kind of a virus that we've hijacked and that the implications for that are wide sweeping. We could, we could allow these cells to attack cancer and, and uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, and sickle cell, sickle cell anemia, all that, that has a lot of wide ranging implications through the delivery mechanism of a virus. So I don't know, viruses to me are, you know, they're, they're for the most part bad, but it, you know, through modern technology, it feels like we're kind of figuring a way to make them useful. Yeah, exactly. Um, they are highly effective, highly efficient at. Oh, we had a bit of a, a bit of a technical issue, but we're back down. We, we were just talking about uh, viruses and how they're very efficient. So, um, yeah, which is, which is wild. Um, how crazy these things are yet. They're not living. Um, I, I feel, I feel like there's on the subject of intelligence, especially biological intelligence. I'm, I've always been fascinated with the programming of like a seed, you know, you plant that in the ground and out, you know, in a, in a year or two, or let's say a hundred years, you have a massive sequoia tree. Like there, there's a certain level of intelligence that's just programmed into the DNA of all of us. You have on the Savannah, you have a wildebeest calf born within minutes after it's born. It's, it's ready to start walking. Like in, you know, the hu human beings, it takes us a year or two, year, year and a half to begin that, to begin walking. We don't have these, you know, we have to learn so much. So the, the, the wide spectrum of intelligence across the, the, in the natural world is something that has always amazed me and something that I really just don't understand. Yeah, and I would say I think of it as programming. So, like, so DNA has these instructions that just looks boring, like letters A T C G. But when it's combined with proteins, then the proteins can go find specific parts of it, and then the proteins will start to do things based on that. And so they might make some products like RNA, and then RNA can go do stuff. So it sets off a domino effect. Like there's this programming and this like. Rube Goldberg machine that's going on. You're just like, what the heck? None of these individual steps like make any like real concrete sense. But you look at the whole series and it's beautiful. It's complex and it's bizarre. And um, yeah, I spend a lot of time actually teaching those parts. And I think it's, it's really fascinating. And then seeing how different organisms or different systems tweak it. Like you said, certain organisms can um, just be basically well-formed on their own and others have a longer nurturing phase. Um, there's a lot of history, evolutionary and DNA-based history there that's been selected for. Um, it's fun to unravel it. It definitely is. And speculate about it. It definitely is. Do you think that there's any credence to the idea of like, let's say evolutionary trauma? Like, you know, you, you look at like young kids, they might have a a fear of the dark or a fear of monster. Do you think that's just hundreds of thousands of years of programming? Because I think that our main predator was epigenetic memory. Thank you, Joan. So epi of, a, of a epigenetic yeah. memory. Uh, so our our ancestors were preyed upon by large cats or, you know, or different wolves or whatever. Do you think that that's part of our programming is that fear of the dark or fear of a monster lurking. Like, do you think that there's some, some truth to that idea? I, I def, there's a lot of amazing things that are kind of imprinted on our DNA, the epigenetic 
genetics that, um, yeah, that that could go back to um, millions of years ago before different species formed. Um, definitely, or they could be shared things that just kind of happened because the dark has unusual things we can't see, and um, we're not set up particularly well to to succeed in the dark. Um, so, so those could be things that converge later, or they could be a shared um, trait. Yeah, and epigenetics is just getting more and more weird and cool that like if um like your grandparents um had uh, experienced starvation that could still be affecting your own metabolism today um uh, that you're basically your dna gets these imprints in it that kind of are, are like switches and so it kind of sets things down a certain path like that domino train um and if you didn't experience that or your ancestors didn't experience that then it would be a different um, set of events. How, yeah, there's definitely a lot to that. Oh, 100%. And, and how how well of an understanding does academia, academics and or, uh, science, is, is, <laughs> have a, have a, how well of an understanding does science have of epigenetics? Is Are we just starting, are we just scratching the surface of our understanding or, or have there been... Uh, there been has there been a lot of progress? I, I don't pay enough attention to that field. I think I got... Hold on one second. Can we pause? Yeah, pause. Sidebar. A few moments later... Someone actually knocked on the door for the first time in like two weeks. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's taken care of. Yeah, so epigenetics, I would say, has really, really made huge strides in about the last 15 years. So just as a very small example, when I was in graduate school, I worked um, in a lab briefly that worked on bread mold, and they had looked at some of the epigenetics... Um, of bread mold and how it related to human cancers. And it just kind of seemed like, oh, that's kind of a cool system. But at that time, we had no idea that that could relate to these um, traumatic or nutritional events uh, in humans um, and in kind of um, an animals, more complex organisms. And so so that that's super fascinating. I think we've it's very popular to be studying epigenetics now. I think there is a lot of a lot of progress that's being made, especially from just like, oh, a bread mold does it, you know, um, to turn genes on and off. And so I think that, um, so we're finding out a lot about, a lot about that. Um, but absolutely, there's a lot more to learn. And some of these things are highly specific to a particular strain, say of mice or a particular event that happened. So, um, so the studies are unique and have to be um, carefully interpreted like any scientific study. Um, and they can be hard to do because if you're following multiple generations, especially in a laboratory environment, um, you got to choose your organism wisely. Um, so, yeah, so there, there's a lot more to learn. And I think we, we are making some good, um, yeah, some good strides with that. Absolutely. Do you, I mean, do you have any interest in sort of like, like CRISPR and, um, man, this is really at the edge of my, I had a gene. <laughs> I, I don't do much on CRISPR. Yeah, yeah, gene yeah, yeah. editing is a word I was searching for. I was like, man, what? I know. Do, do, yeah. Do you, so you don't do much on like gene editing and you don't know. Yeah. That's something. No, that's, but, but. Yeah, there's a biocontrol mechanism that uses symbionts that I do know a fair bit about. So, like, CRISPR is editing genes, so genetic engineering, which can be pretty controversial. Like, um, for example, controlling mosquito populations. There's uh, been a lot of different work on different systems, one of which is a CRISPR system, and that involves genetic engineering changing the actual DNA of the mosquito. There's ways to use symbionts, though, little bacteria that live inside certain insects and then incorporate it into um, different mosquitoes, like the ones that cause human disease, like dengue. Mm -hmm. um, and so the system has been worked out in the last 10, 15 years. It's the same bacteria that I work on, but scientists that work on mosquitoes shuffled one um, bacteria from one mosquito to a different one. And then it uh, basically means that the mosquitoes cannot carry dengue anymore. So they can't, the virus won't, just can't, survive in them. Oh, wow. And so now the scientists have developed um, programs. It's called the World Mosquito um, Program. And so they are releasing millions of these infected mosquitoes um, in different places around the world and with high success um, of decreasing dengue infections. Um, it's pretty impressive. That is very impressive. So we're using 
a bacteria that prevents these mosquitoes from from being able to carry dengue fever. That is fe- what what's the name? What's the name of this bacteria? It's called Wolbachia. Wolbachia. Just the W. Yeah, yeah, and it's pretty much my favorite. What, uh, why is it? Well, <laughs> well, why is Wolbachia your favorite bacteria? Uh, I guess number one is almost everywhere, it, and it does all these favorite bacteria. Wolbachia um, lives in about a, a half of the world's insects. Like if you think of the last two insects you saw, um, or other arthropods, like if you saw a spider or if you saw a fly, there's a fifty-fifty chance that at least one one of them at least had Wolbachia in it. And so it's in all these different organisms, uh, millions of species of, of insects, um, including the beetles that I study. Okay. And um, it can cause these reproductive effects. Um, it can change who, in, who can breed with who. Um, Wolbachia can affect if a virus replicates or not inside a host, like the dengue example. Um, and so there's like these, these stories um, and abilities that 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 group together. So Wolbachia plus its insect, like does something really fascinating that neither one of them is maybe so interesting on its own, Mm -hmm. but together, I think they make a really cool story. Um, And then to just be able to shuffle that um, and then have major effects on human disease is, is fascinating to me. Um, I remember going to, there is a Wolbachia research conference. I went to it about um, (laughs) 12 years ago. Uh huh. (laughs) And, um, and the scientists there, someone started presenting about this dengue thing and everyone's like, what the heck? Um, and it's amazing to see how it's, it's grown um, and is in use on multiple continents and, and a really effective way of controlling mosquitoes instead of using insecticides or um, maybe more expensive or sometimes less culturally acceptable um, approaches like genetic engineering. So it's kind of the middle ground. It's like a, another approach um, for that. That is, yeah, that's very fascinating. Um, do, are there any negative implications for using Wabakia in these mosquitoes? Like what would, and what would some of those be? Cause I mean, I, right? I'm a big proponent of, I mean, there's always some sort of biological hazard um, if we start monkeying around with yeah. the natural order of things. Yeah, and of course, these initial experiments were done in Australia, which is where many of these um, uh, something is re- is released to control another organism, like cane toads. Um, yeah, that's terrible. Um, I'm not sure how they got there. Yeah, then they take over, and you're like, oh God, why did we do that? That was so short sighted. Um, I mean, as far as we can tell, the I mean, Wolbachia is a normal bacteria that lives inside other insects, uh, other mosquitoes specifically, and the mosquitoes are pests. Um, they really only live around humans. Um, these particular mosquitoes. So it doesn't seem like it. Um, initially with the design of which Wolbachia, because there are many, many, many different strains to use. Initially, it seemed like the bacteria that would be used could have caused um, a species to die out. Mm-hmm. But for mosquitoes, who cares, right? Like that would be great. Um, so so there, I think there's been some careful looking into that. And um, I mean, for the most part, they basically, we still have the same mosquito. It's just that now this one has Wolbachia in it and the previous one didn't. So um, I'm not, it's not to say there's not consequences because that's impossible to predict. Uh, but I think the consequences are less than if we, um, we release a whole nother organism that could be eating so many things and reproducing kind of out of control. Um, this is because it's nested. It's like the nested, the Russian nesting dolls. Um, if we, if we still have the same doll that's on the outside, then does it really change a whole lot? Um, so yeah. So I, I think that, I think it'll be interesting to see. I'm optimistic um, over the period of time that that project's been going, that that there's not um, too ill of consequences. Yeah, that'll be so. You have to send me a paper on this because I, I, that's something that I'm I'm pretty interested. In, thing I'd love to follow. I mean, in in yeah. terms of like micro organisms, you know, you shared your favorite Wabaki. I got to share mine. Definitely got to be the tardigrade. Oh, yeah. The water bears. The oh water God. bears. I mean, they can survive the yeah. vacuum of space. Huge. What's up, John? Uh, water bears aren't I said, I said micro, microorganism. Uh, I forget what. That's what I it's said. It's a microorganism. Yeah. It's technically, it's <clears throat> it's a micro animal. It's true. It's, 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 un, really it's in micro- the kingdom. It does have a lot of shit. I was yeah. wrong. 
But Damn I do want to. I want to talk about yeah. water bears. Let's but, yeah. let's do it. Shoot. Let's do it because they can survive yeah. the vacuum of space. They're you know the. They're they're tough. They're tough little bastards. So so yeah. What what do you share with the listeners? Because you'll do a much better job than I can about about tardigrades and how awesome they are. Wow. Well, they are adorable. If, I mean, you have to use a very high powered microscope to see them, and they do look like a little bear with a kind of a squashed face. Um, yeah, and they like to live in, as far as I understand, mosses yep. and lichens, and um, just like those, especially lichen, um, can withstand long periods of drying out. So can these little tiny animals. Um, I'm not sure their exact classification, um, but they're definitely multicellular. And, um, and yeah, they're, they're just adorable. And if you rehydrate, um, the, the environment that they're in, then they can also start to become metabolically active. So they're, yeah, they're just very charismatic. Very, they're very cute. <laughs> I agree. <Yeah. laughs> I spent an afternoon trying to find them when, when summer, I was like, I want to find a water bear. So me and a biologist friend ran out and gra- got ourselves some lichen and spent a bunch of time looking under the microscope. We didn't find them. It was the dry season. Um, so uh, maybe they were there and we just missed them. But I, I definitely, I want to go scout some. Um, I would I would use a badger too, though, <laughs> if I was going to look for a water bear. <laughs> what if they're together? What if they're hunting together? Yeah, I didn't even know. We would, we'd be able to see one. We wouldn't be able to see the other one. I know. Right? That would be the problem. Yeah. Unless the badger could get really small but do, i don't i don't think so do you spend much time like uh i mean maybe not not so much now but like you know in the past did you ever look into animal behavior uh because that to me is like a really fascinating like part like i got obsessed with lions at one point like i didn't understand that they're like i can't remember the name of the the pride but there was a super pride of like or the coalition, excuse me, of like five male lions that took over this massive territory in like the early 2000s. Whoa. And they had like, th- you know, three or four prides of female lions. And they would all split up and like patrol the territory. And they, w- they were just, they were, it was super badass. I had no idea that that was what was going on in the savannah. And they had a pretty big following online and whatnot. But I mean, is that something, you know, in the past that you'd, you'd looked into? Um, not really, honestly, I'm on the exact opposite end of thing. I'm looking at like the tiny things. Like I like, like the last couple summers I dissect like little tiny beetles that are like as big as a pea. I dissect out their like testes and ovaries. Like that's, <laughs> that's the, what the kind of thing that I do <laughs> of dead beetles too. So like, I'm a, I'm a kind of a DNA biologist, I would say. Um, I mean, I think that that stuff is fascinating with animal behavior, but that, that's not something I've worked on so directly. What are these beetles? that you're dissecting and why? Oh, um, yeah. I like to call them the tiny, shiny beetles. Um, their name is Bambidian, and they are one of the most specious groups that we know of on the planet. So this is a genus. If you know the scientific naming system, like Homo sapiens, Homo is the genus, and then sapiens is the species. So Bambidian is the genus of beetles. There's about 1,200 different species that are known of these tiny, shiny beetles, and they live on the edge of water, like by rivers or lakes or sometimes by a glacier. Mm-hmm. And um, and they are, again, very small. M- many of them are shiny, um, and they come out at night usually, and then they will go like find little bits of dead insects um, or larvae that have washed up on the edge of the water. Um, and they can be found almost anywhere in the world. Um, uh, in intertidal areas in the ocean as well. And so um, I've been working on those for a while, and about half of the ones I've tested have Wolbachia. And so I'm trying to look for patterns of what's going on with the Wolbachia genetics um, and match that up with the beetle genetics to see if, um, yeah, they have some some shared history. Do you think that, like, in the instance of, you know, finding Wabakia, is this helping the beetles, like, that have Wabakia? Are they more successful? Like, if you're looking for patterns, I'm just, is that sort of what you're yeah. trying to piece together? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the way that I do it, because they're all dead, um, I work with a scientist at Oregon State University who's spent the last 20, 25 years collecting these beetles all around the world. So all of the ones that I look at are dead. Um, so I don't know any of their life history traits. That would be awesome. But um, but 
that would require living organisms in in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm actually looking for is so this Wolbachia bacteria seems to be able to potentially affect um, speciation, and so it could be responsible for some of the events of insect speciation that we see potentially hundreds of thousands of times that we've gotten different species I, I'm, are because of the Wolbachia. I'm a little bit unclear what speciation means. Right. Yeah, good question. So um, speciation would be if we had one group of organisms that was all in a population and they could all interbreed. Um, if over some period of time, um, it could be because like um, there's a river that forms between them. Now they can't um, breed with each other mm -hmm. physically. And then if you try to reintroduce them later, they've changed too much. Okay. So now they're separate. Um, and so, so insects are really fascinating because there are so many species of them compared to any other groups that we know of that was like, well, what, what caused that? Like, why do they keep splitting? And it, it seems possible, uh, that Wolbachia, this bacteria, um, because of its presence and it affects who can breed with who, which that's an interesting story as well. It could be the driver of how things start to split. What the fuck? So instead of like... For I real? know, right? That's why. Yeah. So, because of a bacteria, this is a hypothesis, right? This isn't. This isn't fact. So that your your, it, your yeah. hypothesis is because there is a bacteria that is infected these insects that it's going to cause speciation, meaning it's going to create a different type of species of beetle that all have Wolbachia. Well, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, it's totally creepy. Yeah, <laughs> it's not just mine. Yeah, so people have found um, over the last couple decades many examples where certain fruit flies can't breed with each other anymore. Like if you remove the Wolbachia, then they can't breed together. And they used to say, oh, it's just a parasite. It doesn't matter. But Wolbachia just keeps showing up in more and more lineages. And so it's it's possible that the presence or absence of it has allowed things to kind of uh, breed together or not um, and start to split. What what advantage would it have for this bacteria to do this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so that's a really good question. So the way that it works is so Wolbachia is considered a reproductive parasite, and so basically just like a virus, it just wants to make more. That's how it benefits. Right. Shit. That's how it continues to spread. Mm -hmm. And now, and so um, Wolbachia lives inside females, um, female insects, specifically in their ovaries, and then it can get packaged into the eggs, which means that every baby that that um, insect has will also be infected with Wolbachia. Mm. So it can spread like that through generations. And then where the reproductive bit comes in is really weird. Um, are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm excited. So, all right. If the female is infected, then she can always make babies. And it doesn't matter if the male has the, the uh, bacteria or not. But if a female doesn't have the bacteria, she, can, she can't make babies with an infected male. And so now she can't make any babies. And so her, basically her line could die out. Um, Whoa. I know, right? Yeah. It's nefarious. That is crazy. So the only way she can have reproduce is to get infected. Or if she finds a male, um, that, doesn't a male have. that doesn't have it. Yep. But, yeah. the, but, and but it's, it basically it's, sets up. Yeah. But it's 50-50, right? It's a 50-50 chance. Wabaki is and everything. Can we get it? Um, not that we know of. That's a good question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I don't want it. <laughs> I think it, yeah, I don't want it. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, basically Wolbachia can select for infected females. So that's the benefit. And then, um, and, but then it also as a downside, um, kind of starts to limit things. Um, so, and set up some barriers basically, which could cause that speciation. Okay. Now is this in... I know you don't study, you're studying dead animals, but I have to ask this question because it's top of mind right now. Does it change mm -hmm. the, if, does it change the, do you know, maybe a colleague or, or, or someone else in this field, right? Do you know of, it, of an, the animals that are, the insects that are infected? Is it, are there, is their behavior changing at all if they have an infected yeah, rate of, of yeah. Wolbachia? That's a good question. Um, for these beetles, I don't think anyone would know, but there definitely are examples that people have looked at behavioral changes with Wolbachia. Um, I don't know the examples off the top of my head, but I definitely could dig around and find some. Um, but yeah, it could change behaviors. Um, I think it was in some ants 
maybe wasps. Um, yeah. And um, another creepy thing that Wabakia does, well, this is actually kind of cool. So Wabakia infects bed bugs. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take the Wabakia away, the bed bug dies. Oh, really? I know, right? Yeah. Because the Wabakia can help with its nutrition because it eats such a weird diet of blood. Um, yeah. So so if we got rid of Wabakia and bed bugs, we'd have no bed bugs. That's good. Yeah, that that is good. No, it's and this is. It's, yeah. I, I didn't even. It, it kind of freaks me out that I didn't know that this existed. I mean, uh, uh, although it doesn't seem to be a problem in human beings, um, right? Which is probably why I don't know about it. But it, it's it's going on in the insect world, which. I mean, insects outnumber us. Like, I don't even, I feel like it's like 20 to 1. They're everywhere. We're always finding new species of the creepy crawlies. Yeah. Well, and Wabaki keeps making them. So there you go. Yeah. Like, right. You just they can't keep, get away they from keep it. making yeah. different types of insects, which is, this is, this is fascinating. <laughs> how, I mean, how did you end up finding out about this? And like, right. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I worked on fruit flies in grad school, um, and I looked at development of the nervous system. So, um, so I really liked fruit flies. I liked insects, and then um, I had um, I, I worked for a little while in a laboratory that looked at corals and symbiosis, and I thought that was really cool. But then I got a job in Denver, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to be near the ocean. This is going to be tricky to work on symbiosis. Um, and so I just decided to put the two projects together. So I was like, all right, so I like insects and I like symbiosis. So is there a bacteria that lives inside of insects? And, um, a friend of mine from grad school had just started working on Wabaki. It was like, Hey, get on the train. <laughs> Let's go on the Wabaki train. Wabaki Express. Woo woo. Yeah. So, um, so that was about 12 or more years ago. And I just, then I, then I started, I kind of became a groupie, right? <laughs> I go to the Wabaki meeting and, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I have my students go out and collect whatever they can find. And then we look for Wabakia in it. And um, yeah, I'm on the team. In- insects are fascinating. Um, they're. And, yeah. And there's so many stories. And Wabakia has got this cool part of it that, I, yeah, I just, I just think it's fascinating. You ever, you ever eat insects? Not on purpose. Um, <laughs> actually, I think I ate a cricket brownie once. Um yeah, but I bike, so de- that's definitely <laughs> I accidentally. Eat them. What about you? Have you eaten any insects? Uh, actually, quite a few. Uh, I, I I buy. I've had several types of cricket. I think I've ate a grub, ant, um, grasshopper. I think that's sweet. That's about it. One was a dare. The other one was just like they were selling crickets at like a tienda, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'll try them out." They weren't that. They weren't that bad. They're not that bad. I'll pretty much eat anything. Kind of crunchy. Yeah, I'll pretty much yeah. eat anything. Like I, I would, I would love to go to one of those uh, chef like weird dinners where they're cooking like tarantulas. If her tarantulas are, are delicious, I'd, I'd, I'd give it a whirl. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, if someone's got a vision, like, why not? And got some good seasoning and, you know, awesome. I, Maybe some butter, oil. Yeah, I think yeah, I have a I million mean. dollar idea, too, like for the, the gym bros out there. So Grizzly Bear, they were, John, actually, you need to Google this because I could be talking my out of my ass here, but I think I'm correct. They were finding grizzly bears at like an alpine level in these scree fields. And like, what the fuck are these bears doing up here? And they were eating moths. They were just eating moths and they were packed with protein. So, I, you know, the yeah. lifter in me is like, mm-hmm. you know what? What if I made some like weird moth protein powder and, and I got huge, yeah. like, you know, bears eat it. Why don't I, I don't even, it probably tasted disgusting. But, you know, if someone wants, if someone out there is listening to this and you want to try that, you heard it here first. It, it was a thought of mine. <laughs> I do not know. You could have a moth farm. Maybe, maybe you make money. I don't know. It's probably going to be gross, though. But that was one thing that I thought was weird. These bears, I think it was in you know in the Yellowstone or something, they were eating, eating a bunch yeah. of moths. They just spent days up there yeah. gorging. It's the Miller moths, they like. There's big, these big, um, I don't know, if sometime in summer or maybe early fall, there's these big migrations that come through. And, yeah, and I guess they're very juicy. Um moths and really delicious and I, I can, i've seen the numbers on that too for how many moths those bears would eat and how many calories they'd get from it it was impressive how many like off the top of your i mean obviously the, it'll probably be incorrect but like ballpark figure how many moths are these bears eating or like one bear um oh yeah i mean i don't it, 
certainly hundreds. I, I don't know if it was in the thousands, like, but you know, just like gorging, you know, Miller moths. Impressive. So that now we have a speech. John, write that down in the RMP expansion plan. So Miller moth protein formulation. That's you want in on this? You can start the marketing now. You want yeah. you want in on this? Oh, I yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's gonna help. Yeah, absolutely, it'll help your biking. Like for sure, you're gonna you'll you'll be able yeah. to build muscle faster. You know, it's yeah. it's gonna be great. I think it's a great idea. Totally good, and I mean, we could even find out. Like, does it taste different with Wolbachia or not? No. <laughs> you're like, no. Now, now you freaked me out. Now I'm worried about getting it. Some sort no. of Wolbachia mad cow. To, like, you know what I'm saying? No, no, I'm out. I'm out now. <laughs> there's a large, there's a large chance that, uh, yeah, fifty percent of those moths would have Wolbachia. But I mean, if we cook it, I think we'd yeah. be all right, right? I think so. How do you kill yeah. Wabakia? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Oh, tetracycline. Oh, shit. Like, like a antibiotic. massive yeah. antibiotic. You're not making me feel good about this. If you're freaking. Anything, <laughs> you're, I'm sure he, heat, heat will kill it, right? Heat would kill it. Yeah, that would. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Yeah, yeah. We're back. We're back yeah, in the clear. Yeah. Just don't eat raw insects, yeah. folks. <laughs> I'm honestly freaked right. out now. Like, I, 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 I kind of am. <laughs> Well, but I mean, you've probably seen the numbers, like how many insects that we just eat. Like if we eat any fresh foods, um, they're just on like whatever produce. So, I mean, we've all been eating insects oh, and, no. and Wolbachia to some degree. I Sorry. don't know yeah. the numbers. What are, to be, enlighten me, please. How many insects? Oh. Does the, yeah, I don't know this. I think it's like hun- you eat hundreds or thousands a year um, just because they're so small and you can't rinse them off. Unless, unless you, well, even even if you do rinse off fastidiously, you can still have some insects in there or in um, prepared foods that maybe weren't rinsed as well. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it. a good protein source. Yeah, so you've it. been giving I'm, yourself I'm a di- protein shake each time you ate produce. I'm dialed in. I'm not scared. What's up, John? Uh, so according to Insider, there is a study that says that humans eat on average 140,000 bugs oh. every year. Um, and I don't, and I, it's not like you're, you're intending to eat a cricket. It's just they're like bits and pieces of them are in chocolate, coffee and flour and just different kinds of processed food. Well, I wasn't expecting that. I'm learning. I'm learning a lot today. This has been a, this has been really enlightening. We eat about 140,000 insects. Wabakia is in 50% of the insects that are on the planet, and uh, it causes speciation. So I I had no idea that this was even going on. Like, that's another thing that fascinates me. It's why I love doing this show. It's like you just learn there are so many different types of worlds, so many different types of people out there looking into things that you don't even think about. And it's amazing. Uh, it, it is truly shocking that, like, this has been going on for millennia and I have no idea. It may, and it drives me nuts because it just makes me wonder how much, like, how much I don't know. That's that's what fascinates me. Like you, you think you kind of have it all figured out. We're, we're you know, we're, everyone's paying attention to what's going on in politics and on social media. And like, there's just this giant world out there that we have no fucking idea about, no clue. And that's just on this planet. That, that don't even get me started on what's going on out there. Like, and what kind of weird biological functions are happening and. <laughs> Uh, in, in space is there like a space bi- that's where i'd be if there's some sort of space biology dog i am th- there's definitely not because we don't know of any other or a badger space i mean badgers. tardigrades can survive tar- there's there's evidence of tardigrades no no 100 that's why they're well. my favorite animals because they can i mean that kind of helps my f- theory of panspermia oh is that what they're your favorite animal in the last hour well listen i thought they were i thought they were <laughs> micro I said that they were micro or John, don't get snappy with me, bro. Don't you dare. <laughs> hey, organisms are not animals. Listen, animals is his own kingdom. Was, okay. We're well, science, listen, brother. I'm ideal in Let's general. Go. <laughs> he, he got me folks. He <laughs> fucking got me. Uh, um, <laughs> you got him. Good job. Got him. I have to Boy. love to fight you after the show, but um, no, I, I, I was just, yeah, I, 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 it's fascinating, and I really appreciate like 
what you're doing and in the in the work that you've done like it's it's pretty amazing and I'm definitely going to continue to to follow this. It's fun. And do you want do you want to hear the weirdest thing? Please. Just learned this a few years ago. Please. Yeah. So we've been talking all about Wolbachia that causes these reproductive barriers that can lead to speciation. It turns out that it's probably not actually Wolbachia, but it's a virus that lives inside of Wolbachia that actually is causing all this. What is this virus? It's called um, Wolbachia W.O. phage. Phage. It's pretty, yeah. It's a phage. So I have a question. Is 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 that type of virus then is that in the same kind of class as the like uh the like parasitic viruses that can infect some insects and actually like c- like kill them yeah, and then control them? Yeah, yeah, what's up with stuff? that? Like Thank you, ant- John. Yeah, it's it's like ants and grasshoppers. That's, a, that's and a fungus, actually. That one is a fungus. Um the virus oh, okay. is so bacteria can have viruses just like we can. So it Wolbachia is a bacteria, so it can have viruses. Um so it's not it's not like the zombie one, unfortunately, though. That would be cool. Um, but it's doing something super creepy either way, you know? Yeah. Wow. What? Yeah. What wow. is that virus that, like, takes over? Like, I think it, it's they found it in ants. They found it in grasshoppers. It, it's like that. Zo- and how there's, like, a bunch of those viruses that are, are yeah, the zombie viruses in the insect world. What, the fungus. It's, yeah, oh, fungus. It's excuse cordiops. me. Yeah. Yeah. Cordiopsis. Cardiopsis, something like that. Yeah, that's a mouthful there um, in the chat. You're the, you're the, you're the scientist. Yeah. I'm not going to attempt to read that. Well, mm, yeah, that's a big one. Um, zombie fungus, uh, <laughs> we'll put, <laughs> for short. We'll put that in the show notes. We'll put that in the show notes, people. <laughs> the good people can. I think it's. I think it's of, Ophiocordyceps uh, unilateralis. Fungus. Unilateralis. unilateralis. I can do that one. Yeah, Ophio unilateralis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Ophiocordiopsis unilateralis. Yeah. It's a fungus. Exactly. I think Cordiopsis is the AKA kind the of group that, that can do that. Yeah, those are weird. Those are weird. Those are, those yeah, are. I like all that stuff that's unseen that you're like, whoa, I can't believe that. Like, And I think like microbiology kind of, for some people, it goes one way or the other. It's either like, wow, that's fascinating, and that was happening, and I'm okay, and the world is you know, still going. And then there's the like, Oh my God, that's creepy. Like, get me out. Like this, I want, I want all of the, I want all the antibacterial. I want all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's cool. I think I fall and, in, I think I fall into the camp of that's creepy. I mean, I interviewed someone that slices brains in half and studies them. And I was horrified the entire <laughs> podcast. Only time I've ever seen Lick, Rick like potentially like throw up or just, be like sickened. Like it was, I was, I, it didn't bother me. I used to watch autopsy videos as a kid, but that like, I can't do that, it. He it was just, just he it's couldn't so handle it. It's so gross to funny. me to it. That used to be a human being. Like I can't, I can't, I couldn't do it. I, I, I mean, I'm fine dissecting. Have, have you ever been to an yeah, open cast? Yeah, and I think that there's before? on, like, on the, I mean, that's, the there's really of, no difference. Y- yes, there. you're holding someone's yeah. brain like you've removed it from the school. It's completely different than like seeing a dead body. Like I think that I've definitely been to open. Ca- I've been to viewings. That doesn't bother me at all. Well, I mean, yeah. it, it's a little <laughs> creepy, but it doesn't. You know, it's. I feel like it's part of life. But like to like like if I, I couldn't be a surgeon, like to pull open a heart, I could do that in animals. That's fine. But people, that's where I'm just you. You lose me, dog. Can't do it. Yeah, and I I never liked any of the dissection stuff. I taught how to dissect a sheep eyeball once, and it was terrifying. I was oh, like, oh, God, see, gross. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, a little bit too... Yeah. I don't want to dissect a sheep eyeball. Like, I could pull it out. I, I bounced out of fish and wildlife science before I got to do necropsy. Ugh, so. That's yeah. gross. Well, uh, I, we're running a little bit shorter, short on time, and uh, you know, I want to be respectful of that. So, I mean, do you have any social media? Do you have any books out? Do you have anything you want to promote? Now's the time. Oh, um, I, I'm on Twitter so that, um, we can put that in the notes. Yeah. I'm yeah. Prof Joanne and I'm not on a whole lot, but I am, I'm working on that. And I think I, I don't have any books myself. I would say finding something that is exciting and going with it. Um, so I haven't written any, but one that I thought was really good about this topic is by Ed Young and it's called, I contain multitudes. 
and it's all about symbiosis and it talks about mosquitoes. I think it might even talk about the zombie fungus too. So um, I think that's a really good uh, launching pad for creepy, crawly, fascinating stuff. All right. Well, well, thank you so much, folks. If you like what you hear, please leave us five stars on iTunes. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and also check out our Clips channel. We love you guys. We'll see you next week and have a great day. Oh,